Amen. Well, uh, you know, th this little clip is a, is a concept I think we're all familiar with, this little cartoon, where there's one angel on the sh one shoulder and a demon on the other. And there's this angel and demon, and they're fighting over what you should do. And this concept has led to some popular trends on social media. There's the, the caption, letting the intrusive thoughts win. You have the, the evil Kermit the Frog meme. One of my favorites. There's also, there's also another one. And then, and then there's a third one that, that maybe hit home for, for a few people. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But in a very real way, the Bible is all about contrast between two opposite ideals. You have good versus evil, heaven versus hell, Jesus versus Satan, hardship versus peace, victory versus loss. And so tonight, we're going to talk about that struggle. We're going to talk about that battle, the very battle for your soul. And that is the title for tonight's lesson. Go to Acts 22, the battle for your soul. Acts 22, the battle for your soul, starts with point number one, which is to defeat the deceit. In order to win the battle for your soul, you must defeat the deceit. In Acts chapter 22, verse 3, Paul said, I am a Jew born of Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in the city. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison. As the high priest and all the council can themselves testify, I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. Paul here tells the story of his life before he became a Christian. Saul pictured here, he's a studious man. He's dedicated, thoroughly trained, it says. He's smart. He's knowledgeable. He says that he's just as zealous for God as many of the religious leaders were. He says he was excited. He, was, he had great energy and enthusiasm. Man, we see, we see great zeal for different things today. We see zeal for our schools. We notice it in our chants or in the good news. We see zeal for food. Just look at some of your Instagram stories. We see zeal at football games. But Paul said he had zeal for God. Now, Today, I think there isn't a shortage of zealous people for God. There's plenty of people who are excited about God, enthusiastic about going to church, give a whole lot of energy towards good causes, missionary projects, and so forth. It says Paul was so zealous for God. However, it also says he was arresting and killing Christians at the same time. And I think many people today are deceived into thinking that being sincere about God is enough. Paul was sincere. He was sincerely mistaken. Sincerely confused, lost. He was deceived. He was zealous for God, but going in the wrong direction. His sincerity was not enough. You know, years ago, I was, I was driving from Walnut Creek, and I lived in Palo Alto. 
but we had to drop someone off in San Mateo. So we had to figure out the route from Walnut Creek, like over the bridge, like across the bay, which highway, and the, the brother who was driving, he, he wanted to avoid tolls. And, and so he turned off, you know, on your maps, on your phone, you can like avoid tolls as like an option. And, and the drive seemed to be taking a little bit longer than, than I thought it should. And he just kept driving. And he kept glancing like at the highway signs, like hoping we're on the right road. On and on we went. I'm like, where, where are we? And he says, I'm not sure. He says, he says, I think we're on the right road, but I'm not positive. And so like, I pulled out my, like, like my, my map, my phone. I'm like, where, you know, like, where, look, where's my location? And it showed we were on the completely wrong road. Now, if you know Walnut Creek to San Mateo, just take the San Mateo Bridge right across. We went all the way around the bay, San Jose, and I'm like, this took so long. <laughs> Spent like way more time trying to get back on the right road because then I had to drive past my house in Palo Alto to drop someone off in San Mateo. Maybe you've been given wrong directions. Are you sure you are going the right way as Paul thought he did? Are you deceived? Have you been told, just be good? Just go pray. Just go to church. You'll make it to heaven. But tonight, I'm here to tell you that that's not enough. Because just like Paul, my friend, the driver, he thought he chose what was the right road and just kept on driving. But God tells us in his word, in his Bible, in Proverbs 14, that there is a way that appears right, but in the end leads to death. Perhaps you think you know the right way tonight, or maybe you're trying with no map and no guide to get to heaven on your own. If so, it will only end up in death. Let's go to Romans chapter 10. Romans 10. Romans 10 and verse 1 says, Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God. But their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. When it comes to following God, when it comes to the Bible, there is a right way and there's a wrong way. You know, we're here at, at, at UC Berkeley tonight, and uh, the, 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 the school rival is Stanford. <laughs> Every year, there's the big game where Cal football plays Stanford football. It's one of the oldest college rivalries in the country. And one year during the big game, in 1982, Stanford had a one-point lead, 20 to 19. Four seconds left in the game. Stanford kicks the ball off. Cal's going to return it. And the Golden Bears, that's Cal, used five lateral passes to score the winning touchdown in the final seconds. Won 25-20. But here's the thing. The Stanford team, the Stanford side, the Stanford band, believing that the game was over, came onto the field midway through that last play. The ball carrier for Cal literally had to run over the trombone player of the band. Because they decided to celebrate prematurely. Everyone makes mistakes. If you're a Stanford band player, maybe it's more mistakes. But We've all been wrong at some point. It's actually impossible to know everything. Sometimes it's just that we don't know. Sometimes we forget. Sometimes we get confused. Sometimes we learn facts 
and information that's actually not correct or true. Most of us here tonight grew up in some sort of religious environment. Thinking and being told we were doing the right thing. But then you get into a Bible study. For me, the first time I sat down and studied the Bible, it was like, I, didn't, I knew that I didn't know everything. I was like, I, that's what it says? I didn't know that was in there. That was me when I studied the Bible. And it forces us, when we look at the scriptures, to take an introspective look at ourselves and be willing to admit, I was wrong. The biggest hindrance to this, to this, this fact, this truth, the biggest obstacle in this area is deceit. Sadly, Satan, the devil, also known as the deceiver, the father of lies, the master of deception, has influenced and infiltrated Christianity as we know it today. And what Satan has done in his cleverness, in his craftiness, in order to suppress the truth and make it unclear, is that he's changed this. Just enough, ever so subtly, so that you and I may not recognize it. So that we are easily deceived. Just so long as you don't know the truth. Go to 1 John chapter 2. How do you know? How would I know? How will we know? And how do you defeat deceit? In 1 John chapter 2. Verse 3 says, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Many people talk Christianity, but very few actually walk Christianity. You know the saying, talk is cheap. But to do, to live in, to abide, to actually walk is completely different. We must be those who choose, who decide to live in truth, to walk in truth. Otherwise, we'll just repeat the cycle of deceit that Satan has carefully orchestrated in the world that we all live in. Tonight, you might say, I feel like a Christian. I feel a lot of things. Doesn't make it true. Christianity today has been associated with emotion. But to actually walk in the truth, to live by the teachings of Jesus, to actually do it, is what separates the little kids from the adults. The men from the boys, the women from the girls. Living a double life is a dangerous thing. We live in a time of lies and deceit. When people post on social media that, that they have everything together, that, that life is just a vacation, but when you peel back the layers, look behind the screen, see what's actually going on in people's minds, in people's hearts, and in people's lives, we see the need for truth. Christianity, true Christianity, starts in the mind. 
refuses to be slaves to the devil. We've got to be those who control, who govern our minds by the spirit, not the flesh. To take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Go to Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah 17. You know, one of the most common lies of this world is follow your heart. Listen to your heart. Trust your heart. But let's see what the Bible says. In Jeremiah 17, verse 9, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Verse 10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart, examine the mind, to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. The heart is deceitful above all else. Think of the most deceitful thing or person you've ever encountered. And your heart is more deceitful than that. It says above all else, beyond Cure. It cannot be trusted. I think the worst form of deceit is self deceit. You know, you sit down to do a Bible study. No, no, no. Let's back up. You run into someone who says, hey, would you be willing to do a Bible study? I don't have time. Or better yet, better yet, better yet. I will have time later. Maybe when I'm older, when I have more time. But to me, that makes no sense. Think about it. How deceptive is it to say, I will have time later because I don't have time now? What makes you think you're not going to be busy later? In college right now, you have more free time than you will ever have. Someone says, you know, I'm good. Good, good for you, you keep on doing what you're doing, but for me, hey, I'm good. Or better yet, open up the scriptures and it, I, I, I don't understand what it says. Read it. The Bible was written in a 6th to 8th grade reading level. This is college. It's very clear. But don't deceive yourself into making this more complicated than it needs to be. Instead of deceiving yourself, just admit that you just don't want to submit. It's a world of superlative excuses. Or I, I, I'm too young, or I'm too busy, or I'm too tired, or I'm too good, too independent, too happy. But before you know it, it's going to be too late. <laughs> Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Verse 24. Says, therefore, God gave them over in their sinful desires of their hearts 
to sexual impurity, for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Satan has a very clear objective. See, he also wants you to be a worshiper. He wants you to worship anything and everything except God. He wants you to exchange the truth for a lie. Who is your God? Who do you serve? What do you value? Is it money? Is it your time? Is it your, your own comforts? Your own thoughts, your own feelings, your own opinions? Mom and dad's opinion? We must be those who worship the creator. You know, the prophet Jeremiah says right after he tells us that the heart is deceitful, that God searches the heart and rewards each person according to their conduct, according to what they do, what their actions deserve. But Satan has used society and religion alike as a decoy to water down this message and lead people astray. And he uses these outlets to continue his message as the father of lies. He wants to destroy the very message, the very truth that will get you to heaven. Wow. You know, I look at this room tonight and I see a group of young men and women that want to do something about it, that want to defeat the deceit. Go back to Acts chapter 22. Acts 22, point number two. Fight for the right truth. Fight for the right truth. Acts 22 and verse 6. It says, about noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord? I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. Paul describes how Jesus blinded him to get his attention. And Jesus spoke to him and told him that he was deceived. That he was going in the wrong direction. Paul had the zeal, but he needed that zeal to be pointed in the correct direction. To be pointed toward truth. You know, the word truth is in the Bible more than 100 times. And John 4, verse 23 says, Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. They are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. It says God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The time has come when true worshipers, meaning don't be a false worshiper, for all of us in this room, the calling tonight is to be a true worshiper. To worship, yes, in spirit. Yes, in sincerity. Yes, with zeal. But with truth. John 14, verse 6. Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the what? Now, what separates Jesus from any other moral teacher is that he claimed to be the truth. Not just to know it. 
We live in a world where, in my opinion, in my feelings, are more important than anything else. Don't offend me. You know, I could walk on campus and I can find a club, I can find a group, I can find a person that says, if I feel like a cat, then I can identify as a cat. As, as ridiculous as that sounds, in this day and age we live in, I am forced to accept that as truth. And if you disagree with my opinion, then you're wrong. And people protect it at all costs. Even at the cost of compromising what's actually true. Because any person can look at that person and say they're not a cat. But my opinion is so important, my feelings are so important that the truth doesn't matter. I'm gonna take my feelings and put it above what's real. The world has twisted this idea of truth. Substituting fact as opinion and accepting opinion as fact. And it's all backwards. To the point where if I have a belief, if I have a conviction in something, and if it offends someone else or hurts someone's feelings, then throw it out. We live in a world of tolerance. Unless you have a, a, a standard, then we're intolerant and it doesn't make any sense. And then we're back to point one where we're deceiving everyone. And then we're in self-deceit. And then where is truth? And then everyone, like, there's, there's nothing's happening. And everyone's stuck. But the thing about truth, the thing about truth, is that it doesn't change just because you're not feeling it. Or it doesn't agree with your opinions. Because opinions are not fact. Two plus two is four, no matter how you feel about it. And God says, God says I'm searching for people that are going to hang on to what's actually true. The men and women who want to worship in spirit and in truth. Not by my own experiences, not by my own knowledge, not by my own opinions, not especially according to my own desires. And so I want to bring some truth to you tonight. There's a quote that says, honesty is often very hard. The truth is often painful, but the freedom it can bring is worth the trying. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 reads, This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people. See, God wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of of the truth. What God desires is for us to desire truth. He wants all people to come to a knowledge of the truth that will lead to salvation. Implying what? That we're not born knowing truth. It must be acquired. If truth is not acquired, if truth is not pursued, if truth is not desired, not found, then truth will be absent. And truth won't be there. But sometimes truth is uncomfortable before it becomes comfortable. We all know the saying, the truth hurts. Or the line from the movie, a few good men, you can't handle the truth. Paul even talks about it in 2 Corinthians 7. He says, even though that the truth may hurt, it may cause sorrow, it may cause pain, it causes us to change. Yeah. 
It calls us to repent. This is godly sorrow. Brought out by the truth. It produces concern, longing, readiness to see justice, Paul says. You know, you can start with truth. You could hear it. You could read it. You could know it. Doesn't mean you'll end with truth. It all depends on if you're going to listen. If you're going to change. Listening takes paying attention. It takes effort. Go to Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59. You know, I love the Bible because it shows us what, what's going on today, even if it happened hundreds of years ago. In Isaiah 59, verse 15, it says, Truth is nowhere to be found. And whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm achieved salvation for him and his own righteousness sustained him. Here we see the nation of Israel who had spent too much time willfully persistently in rebellion of truth that the nation became unable to take action against its own sins the thing about sin and wickedness is it will fill the void when God's truth doesn't fill your life and the times today are no different than what we just read people desire religion but not truth. Why? Because religion just makes me feel less guilty. But the truth calls you to change. Truth is more absent today than it's ever been. Today, it's just about being a good person. That's how I grew up. You know, what I used to think, just be a good person. It wasn't even that. My thought my ideals, my religion growing up was not that just you had to be a good person. It was that you didn't, don't be a terrible person. That was my standard. And, 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 and I, as I look back, that wasn't actually even my standard. It was if I can just make people think I'm not a terrible person. And I thought in my deception, in my deceit, in my lack of truth, that all religions just basically teach the same thing anyway. But I realized that this false truth was that I just wanted to feel good about myself. Not actually change my bad habits. Go to John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse 31. One of my favorite scriptures. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. Then you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You know, you walk around campus, you walk around wherever you're at, and everyone knows the last five words. The truth will set you free. You see it on a, a, a courthouse, you see it on the, the business building in the library, but what about the, the rest of it? Jesus is talking to people who believed him and he tells them it's not enough. Jesus says, you must actually obey what I teach. That you must follow the scriptures. Then the truth will set you free. Free from what? Let me give you some statistics. Some, Some truth about the world we live in. Nearly 20 people per minute are physically abused by a partner in the United States. In one year, that equates to 10 million people. 50% of people 12 and older have used illicit drugs. 
Among Americans age 12 and older, over 37 million are currently illegal drug users. Meaning they use drugs in the last 30 days. And this is increasing by 4% every year. 28.3 million, or 20% of them, have an alcohol use disorder. One in five married men have confessed infidelity. You know, when I look at these stats on, on, on 12, year, 12 year olds, that was me. First time I, I got drunk, I think it was in fifth grade. First time I did drugs, sixth grade. People want to be distant from God in this life. But then they want to be close to God in heaven. If you're here tonight and you're still wrestling with the call to study the Bible, to become a disciple, to get baptized, simply accept it for the truth that it is. Believe and be convinced that you are being called by God. Because this isn't just another club that meets on a Friday night. This is a group of revolutionaries actually fighting to restore Christianity back to the standard of the truth of the Bible. Let's go back to Acts 22. Our third and last point. Win today. You got to defeat deceit. You got to fight for the right truth. And you have to win today. Acts 22, verse 12. says, a man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Then he said, The God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear the words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all people. Of what you've seen and heard. Now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, washing your sins away, calling on his name. Jesus directed Saul to go to Damascus to meet Ananias. And he finally got there. Ananias heals him. He helped him to see. And Ananias tells him, what are you waiting for? See, Paul was already zealous for God. He studied under Gamaliel. He was thoroughly trained. But he was persecuting Jesus, arresting his followers, and punished them as prisoners to the point of death. He thought all that he was doing was in the name of God. Then Jesus blinds him and sends him on a journey of truth. And Paul knows what he needs to do. But Ananias asked him, what are you waiting for? Implying that Paul was hesitant. He was hesitant, I think, because he didn't know he was going in the wrong direction and they could see. You know, it can be a very uncomfortable feeling to find out you're wrong. That you've been deceived. You can feel embarrassed, ashamed. Maybe stupid or useless, or maybe angry. And, and all these feelings are okay. But it's all about how you respond and what you do. You know, when we find out we're wrong, usually the best step, the first step, is to admit it. Like, step one, admit you're wrong. You ever try to, like, fight when someone, like, finds out that you were wrong about something? And it's like a circle of, no, I, mean, uh, just, uh, I, I was wrong. Just admit it. And actually be grateful that someone pointed it out and corrected you. Like, would you want to just continue living a lie? 
but then to make the necessary changes, no matter what they may be, or how challenging it may feel. Some of us here tonight are hesitating. Hesitating to obey God. Hesitating to submit to the truth of the scriptures. Hesitating to surrender control. Say things like, I, just, I, just, I need to fully understand everything in here first. I need, I, need to read, I need to read the whole Bible. I need to see what others have to say. I don't, I, I, I don't want to rush. But that doesn't sound like holding to the truth to me. You know, sometimes not rushing into things can be a good thing. You know, it's been said patience is a virtue. But there's some things that are worth waiting for and some things that aren't. Some things that are worth waiting for. Maybe you're, you bake a pizza, bake some cookies. You, you, sh you should probably wait. Some things you shouldn't wait for. Going to the doctor. Going to the dentist. Doing your laundry. Calling your parents. See, I learned this lesson recently because my mother passed away three months ago. And I learned in a very hard, harsh reality that there are some things that shouldn't wait. And for those of us here tonight, let it not be said that you waited on God. Too many people, too many people are waiting. Too many people are hesitating, putting off a right relationship with God. But just like Ananias said to Paul, what are you waiting for? When today. Sometimes when our eyes get open and our sight restored like Paul, we're left in a state of shock. But with God, there, there isn't any reason why you should not get into a right and proper relationship with him. Because tonight he's trying to get your attention. He's trying to point us in the right direction. Because he loves us and he wants us to love him. So the challenge tonight is not to hesitate. To actually get into a right relationship with God. What are you waiting for? See, Paul needed Ananias to push him. In the same way, we need people in our lives to push us out of our comfort zone. Ask the person sitting next to you to get into a Bible study. To go after your relationship with God. To put, to rest. That's good. Hey, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? But for all of us tonight, we got to put the re to rest the lies of Satan and the deceit of our heart needs to be defeated. We got to strive to know the scriptures and to obey them, to fight for truth, to make a decision today to win the battle for your soul and to God be all the glory.